Oh, hello. Hello. Oh, that's, there, we are. there we are. Hello. Hello, hello. Little, thank you. A little more enthusiasm. <laughs> Uh, before I get started, I wanted to say that uh, somebody found a wallet. So if you're missing a wallet, it's right over there on that table. <laughs> Next, I'm going to give it to the organizers. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for coming to my talk. Uh, this is a talk about my journey, both from a company perspective and from a personal perspective. Um, it's, this is my third year coming to DevConf. Uh, it is really awesome to be uh, asked back to such a amazing conference and uh, an amazing country as well. Uh, so thank you very much. So um, before, I guess we'll dive right in. I want to talk about this company right here. <clears throat> it's a little breathy. So this company is called Rivet. And what Rivet is, is it is a, a startup that is in the construction vertical. Uh, the startup specializes in making software talk to other software. So it's an integration software company. Um, specifically, what that means is that I get to work with systems that are anywhere from a uh, modern SaaS, software as a service application, all the way down to 25-year-old uh, uh, accounting software that has been used for, and it just happens to be the dominant player in the, uh, in the, software, in the construction world, uh, specifically for accounting. So this is a talk about Rivet. I've been there almost since the beginning. Um, this is a talk about Rivet and a talk about myself. Talk about this is a talk about the rewrites that happened at Rivet. So um, it, it's gone through three three major ones that I've kind of identified, all the way from where it was just a project for a for a customer of ours, all the way to a platform as a service kind of thing. But it's not just a just not it's not just a talk about the company. It's also uh, a talk about myself, and uh, this is me, and uh, this is me. Um, about five years, 2014, circa 2014, about 30 pounds heavier. <laughs> um, and I wanted to get started by telling you a little bit of a story, a little bit of a backdrop about how I got into the industry. So I worked for a company called JC. Uh, JC is not a very big company. You probably wouldn't know it if you knew it, if you heard, if you saw it. Um, it's a company that uh, is, is one of those that's not a technology-based company. It's, it's a company that has a technology department. And at the time, I was hired uh, kind of on accident. I was hired to do uh, support. And in the pursuit of trying to find a picture from that time of me trying to do support, this is the best thing that I could come up with. Uh, this is me from college. I think I was playing Xbox or something like that. But this is how I looked because I wore a headset. I wore a headset pretty often because I was all, all on the phone a lot. And I was doing things like fixing printers to, and, and all, by the way, all these locations that I was working with were all 18 locations around the country. So a lot of these times, these were people who didn't know technology very well, and I had to get on the phone with them and walk them through uh, fixing their printer. Thank God they had like remote control software at that point, because that made my job a heck of a lot easier. And uh, this was our department before I joined. So it was made up of three people. Uh, an IT manager, a developer who was a contractor, and a quote-unquote support person. Uh, I say quote-unquote support person because they weren't a full-time support person. They were actually one of the owners of the company, a 150-person company, and the owner was doing support. Uh, at this time, they really hadn't identified that they needed somebody in the support role full-time because they really did. And so the, one of the guys that owned the, com that owned the company that just happened to be good at technology... Uh, he was the one who was taking phone calls to make sure to make the printers work. And so I came on for a temporary project uh, in charge of inventorying computers. And so I became the support person. Uh, I remember the first time I took a call because I was just a temporary worker at the time. I said, hey, do you want me to try to fix it? And the owner was like, heck, yes, I want you to try to fix it. It's a lot cheaper to pay you than it is to pay somebody else to go out there. And I'm busy right now. So eventually hired on full time, became the support person. And it was pretty good. I was working with awesome technologies. I was working with things like Windows XP and Windows Server 2003. We had several in the closet. And my favorite, Exchange Server 2003. Uh, <laughs> I hear some laughter in the crowd because anybody who has worked with Exchange Server 2003 knows how finicky it can be. And me coming in, having no knowledge of it, it was not very... Uh, I, let me, let's just say I didn't have an easy time with it. And so I spent a lot of my time learning and reading. And uh, so when, when I got to the work in the office in the morning, I'm not much of a morning person. I'm not, I, I just can't roll and just start to work. So usually what I do in the morning, 
I open up Firefox or uh, Chrome or whatever, and I start flipping through my news sites, and I start reading, and I read, and I absorbed as much as I could about technology because I was convinced I was going to be a Microsoft support person. I thought I was going to be working in the infrastructure side. Until one day, I was talking to my boss, and I said, hey, I, I have a question. Uh, I want to do development. What do, you, what do you think? And he was like, think about what was going through his mind. I was maybe paid 10 bucks an hour. And it, going through his mind, he's looking over at the contractor who's making 100 And he's thinking like, well, if I, can, if I can trick this guy into developing software for me, I could get a lot more work. Out, I could get work out of him for a lot less. And so this is how the conversation went. Can I be a developer too? Mm, yeah. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Why not, right? Because there's not much risk in it for them. I just learned development and uh, hope to, and maybe I'll create something that was uh, awesome. At this point, I had rebuffed uh, many of my friends' attempts to take programming classes. Uh, the first and only programming class I took in college, I got a C plus. And so at this point, I didn't think it was a viable career option for me uh, until this moment where I was like, well, let's just try something new. And uh, you might be surprised to know what the first language I learned was. Uh, it was in the, definitely in the .NET realm, kind of, right? It wasn't VB.NET, and it wasn't C Sharp, and it wasn't even JavaScript. It was SQL. The first language that I learned how to write well was SQL. And when I say well, this is how I thought I wrote SQL. I thought I was as cool as this guy, when in reality, I looked more like this guy. I didn't write SQL very well, but it did teach me a lot of things about data. Um, and it actually took a lot of work off my boss's plate, who was always in SQL Server Management Studio fixing something for somebody. Um, because the application was so incomplete in many ways, he had to go in and manually change tables every day to do for some reason or another. And he told me very simple rules. He gave me the production password, actually the, sys, the SA account in SQL Server, which, by the way, for a new person, I would not recommend doing that. And he said, there's just a few rules for playing around in production. Don't delete anything unless you're going to back it up first. Don't change anything unless you back it up first. And don't even insert anything unless, until you back it up first. So what this instilled in me was a deep data paranoia. I inherited my boss's data paranoia. And this is going to be important, so I will come back to this. Come back to that. Keep that in the back of your head. So first language, SQL, it was a great language. It was a great experience. I took a couple classes. I, I became productive, um, learning my craft, so to speak, I guess, for SQL. And then the next language was VB.NET because the application that I worked on was a VB.NET web forms application. Yeah, that's pretty cool. I mean, it wasn't just web forms, it was VB.net, which is awesome. How many people work on web forms today? Uh, yeah, I see a few hands raised. Usually when I ask this question, this is what happens. Uh, how many people work on web? Anybody here work on uh, web forms applications? They just, they, they're very shy, but uh, I still do occasionally. It's just part of the job, right? Not at Rivet. <laughs> Um, so this is the application that we had. It was pretty simple. It was, uh, there wasn't really much to it. It was a web application, ASP.NET Web Forms, um, with VB.NET backed by a SQL Server database, an old piece of account management software written in VB6, which, thank God, I only had to change that code a handful of times, and then batch processes that did some daily job kind of things. And I continued my pattern. I continued down my path of just learning and absorbing as much as possible. And so at some point, I actually became pretty good. I became very familiar with web, web forms, and they decided that they didn't need a contractor anymore. They could just pay me. And the contractor at the time, they had at the time, uh, was so good at his job that he really, what he really did was uh, write VB6 code in VB.net. He just only knew VB6, so he just wrote VB.net code, and it was pretty bad. So eventually, they replaced him with me, and I became immediately productive. They replaced him with me, and then we... Um, hired a support guy. This is, this, na this name is Andrew. He's a real person. And, um, he, uh, so that was really awesome. That took support off my plate and then I could focus on development full time. And I was closing tickets. I was doing stuff. I was making magic happen. It was awesome. I was super productive. I felt like I was on the top of the world. And I really like to qualify myself as not necessarily, I was a junior engineer, no, no, for sure, but I was more of a get stuff done engineer, right? I was just writing code and, and not terrible code either, going back and looking at it. Um, I was writing code, I was closing, and I was doing it with decent quality. So I was getting stuff done. 
And then one day, yeah, we've got a story. Of course, the business has to change. Things must change. So the, they came to me with a fairly complicated problem. And, uh, you, know, and you know, she's looking at you like, yeah, yeah. Let's see what you're, let's see what you're made of now. Because they, actually, they wanted to incorporate text messaging. So they got texting. So we needed to be able to send and receive text messages on a mobile phone and on the website and have real-time push notifications. What they wanted to do was eliminate people using their personal devices to text our clients. So they wanted it to route through a system. And I was like, I have no idea. Think about what you would be if you were like a year engineering and you were faced with this massive problem. And no, you didn't have access to consultants. Nobody could come in and help you. You just, excuse me, you kind of just had to figure it out. But that's okay. I know what I can do because I'd done all that research. I'd done all that reading. So I was able to pick out Xamarin at the time. It was still buggy. It was really buggy at the time, but it worked. And I needed to be able to do real-time. So I was like, well, what's a good real-time platform? So naturally, .NET, I used SignalR. I still kind of didn't know what I was doing, but I was just experimenting. And I was using lots of different technologies. And... Uh, the things that I had to do were, our releases were really painful. And when I say really painful, they were manual, and it, they, 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 took a, they took usually about an hour, and I couldn't just do it in the middle of the day. So I had to make sure that whatever was talking to my, whatever was talking to my phone, whatever was talking to the back end, I had to make sure it was out of the way. I had to make sure that I could deploy it uh, separately. If the main application would get down, we still wanted to be able to queue up those text messages. And we needed to set up a push notification system to ensure timely response. Uh, all of these, by the way, that includes using Apple and Android, because it was cross-platform, cross right, as Xamarin, using all of their, setting up all their development environments for push notifications. It was a lot of work, let me say. And I ended up coming up with something like this. I actually did it. I did all this stuff. So I had a back end for this application. And it connected to our sales app, uh, and it talked to the database. Well, this is what I roughly, I think this is what I sketched at the time. And I identified message queues as uh, the, the really the, the way to do, sort of decouple this um, back-end application for this mobile phone device. I identified message queues. So this is about how it looked. Use all the messages between the app and the sales, the sales app and the back-end app ran through RabbitMQ. So what I ended up creating was a decoupled application. Uh, fun fact, after, doing re after reading more and more as, as time went on, I kind of, and I was putting the slide deck together, I realized that I had kind of accidentally created a microservice of some kind because it was separately deployed. So I was pretty proud of that little fact because I didn't know what I was doing then. <laughs> and so the lesson that I learned from this was to learn something new every day or learn something new every week. Uh, or really, uh, you know what, I, I don't want to be dogmatic about how often you should learn. Uh, I, I like to say just be a consistent learner. And that really served me well to, uh, when I get it to work in the morning and I do my reading. It's a ritual that I still do to this day. And that's how I keep up on things like, you know, .NET Core 3 or C Sharp 8.0 or um, whatever microservice buzzword they're creating these days. That's how I kind of stay ahead of that. Your, your process may be different, but I encourage everybody to do that. And uh, then, you know, B, this is, again, this is the, uh, what we kind of ended up with. And eventually, I identified in my reading AngularJS. I was tired of writing web forms applications, mainly because um, it, it, they, it, you know, the, the postbacks, you know, it was very slow to get things done. The Ajax toolkit. Anybody work with the Ajax toolkit? That's stuff made of nightmares. That's the stuff nightmares are made of is that Ajax toolkit didn't work very well, at least not for me. I couldn't get it to work well across all of the browsers that we had to support. So I identified JS and eventually buttoned that onto the application. And again, that worked pretty well. And you notice that we phased out that account management software. Eventually, it, I think, to this day, it's still in production for like one or two random things. They have to dust it off and use it. But for the most part, it got phased out. And getting along the learning thing, the Xamarin app that I wrote, that I put a lot of time and effort into, ended up getting phased out as well. It was actually something that I was certain that they would want to use. And it turned out it worked pretty well, but they didn't want to use it. They just wanted to stay within the main sales application. Uh, I really pushed for this, and eventually it just got shuttered because nobody was using it. So lesson learned there. 
so after all these things, after all these rewrites, this is rewrite zero for me. This is, I guess you could say, the first write. Uh, I always like to retrospect. Retrospectives are very useful. So I want to talk about what fit and what didn't. So first off, off the top, I delivered tons of business value. I was getting stuff done. I was really productive. It wasn't perfect code by any means, but my boss recognized it. The owners of the company recognized it. I felt like, again, I felt like I was on the top of the world. But here be the dragons. Here be the dragons. With the good comes with bad. With the bitter comes the sweet. What I ended up creating worked, but I didn't really end up improving anything around the deployment. You know, the DevOps was a relatively new concept at the time, and certainly not one that I was, I wouldn't say it was super new, but it was really the maturity around DevOps was really starting to formulate. The application, first and foremost, it was fragile. We had dependency problems. We had deployment issues. We had no, we had no way of smoking those out ahead of time unless we like battered it. And my boss didn't have time to do that most of the time. There's no good way to detect problems, right? So there was no, we had a lot of different decoupled processes, but there was no central like error reporting system. So it really didn't work out very well. Deployments were still all manual. They were all right-click publish. Uh, I have a friend who says, friends don't let friends light right-click publish, and I know why. It just is, it was, it was a hour-long process. It wasn't any fun. I had to do it at night. You know, it was just part of the job. And then, perhaps most shamefully of all, there was no testing. There was no automated testing of any kind. And the application was rather large, and my boss didn't have time to regression test. And yes, occasionally things were broke in the like, main part of the application that made money. So that was no good. And uh, I'm so ashamed of it, I'm actually going to make it bigger. I really, the, the no testing thing really is, I look back and say to myself, I, I, I feel like I missed a lot of opportunities. Uh, it was part of the maturity. It was part of growth. Um, when, me and my, when me and my buddy, Andrew, would do deployments, it would look something, we'd, it would look something like this. <laughs> Put on your sunglasses and let's go. Let's hit the wall as fast as we can. So um, eventually, Andrew himself got into development, and that was really cool to have somebody to kind of mentor and work with. Until one day he gets an email, and he says, hey, Spencer, this is an opportunity I think you'll really like. And that's when Rivet happened. Woo, we finally got at the end of this one. So again, this was me, pretty young. I feel as mature as this guy here, um, or at least I did. I, I feel like I was just that mature just then. Again, getting stuff done, but I was getting stuff done at a cost. It wasn't a great, it, it, it was good, but it was a mixed bag, right? So now we get on to Rivet. So it's really that little bit of background, I think, will help illustrate some other parts of the story. So again, continuing on the rewrites, not just the rewrites for the product itself, but the rewrites for myself. I was got, started at a get stuff done engineer or a junior engineer, whatever you want to be. And I had to rewrite myself into a senior dev. I hope that sounded as corny as I thought it did. And then I had to rewrite myself into an architect. And then, uh, you know, who, who knows what the future holds? So let's talk about the first rewrite, finally getting into Rivet. So... This is what the system looked like at the time. So again, this is integration software. So this is specifically for construction companies. So we had a couple of different pieces that were important to talk about. We had the connector app, which, is, uh, which, which was an application that ran in task schedule, scheduler at the time. It woke up, did a job, and then went back to sleep. It happened once a day or once every 12 hours or once every hour. I don't exactly remember. But it was querying a local database on a customer's site, right? It wasn't a SaaS product. It didn't have an API. We just queried it in the connector app, and that worked well. And then, of course, we had the other side, which is the job running system. We called it cloud service. And cloud service, very similarly, would wake up, do its job, and then go back to sleep. Um, wasn't really much to it. Let's see. Yep, data process app. So this is kind of how the steps worked. So we would do this. We would do the... We would centralize all the data from all of the systems into our system cache. So that was our separate cache of all of these systems data. And then we would merge them. We would actually merge them into a central database, which acted as the, quote, one source of truth for all of the data. And then at the end, once the data was merged, we did some logic. We figured out what records were missing in one system versus another. And we called whatever API. We sent data over the wire and used insert statements, or we called a REST API to get that data into the other system. 
Sounds pretty simple, right? What could go wrong? It's never that simple. We had so many problems with this first system. So this was actually, again, this was taken from a project that was written for one person and turned into a product. So there were a lot of problems with this. This, let, but, but before we do, before I dive into those, let me talk a little bit more about the model. So I'm going to use a few terms that, you know, it, it confuses riveters to this day. We have uploading, which uh, essentially means that we're taking the data from the system and we're putting it into our local cache. So we use the REST API, we use those SQL statements. Uh, and what we did was we used Entity Framework, we created a table to hold that, we created a model for that table, we created the table, and then we inserted the data. It was great, it was fine, it wasn't great. It was a lot of boilerplate, a lot of boring code to write. We felt like we could automate it, but we never got to that point, at least not then. And then there was the process we called synchronizing, which is taking the data from the system cache and moving it into the central database. It was all transferred versus ver, ver, uh, via stored procedure, so all the data was taken from one SQL database to another one via stored procedure. It had limited and not very good dupe detection, which is a big problem. And then, again, it was a lot of boilerplate. It was a lot of the same SQL statements written over and over again. And we'll come back to that in a little bit. And then we had the process called downloading, where we took the data from the central database and sent it into the system. We called the external APIs, we ran the insert statements, and then we marked them as downloaded in the central database. Which sounds so simple, right? Well, we'll get to that, how simple that was in a little bit. So, retrospective, what fit, what didn't? So let's start with the good. We had, a lot, we had a few early beta customers that helped us develop requirements. They helped us develop the behavior of that integration. And we were delivering value pretty early. We were making those systems talk. This was unheard of at the time for these. I mean, integration is everywhere and has been for a while. But to get these two particular products to talk, uh, that was a big deal then. But of course, with the good comes the bad, the bitter comes the sweet. We have to talk about the dragons, right? That's the best part of retrospective. So there was a lot of incorrect or even duplicated data between those systems. Uh, the one problem that I can think of early on was that we used a value as a unique key. And that customer, that customer was the only one who used that as a unique key. Other systems uh, treated that, the, the, the target system, it wasn't a unique key there. And lots of customers had problems with duplicate data. That was a big deal. Duplicated hundreds of records at some point. And we didn't, and, and the worst part is we didn't know until it was, until the customer complained, which was really bad. The state of the objects was hard to track. It was hard to keep these things in sync. If you're using stored procedures to, you know, to just move data from one to another, it turned out to be nothing more than a really fancy ETL process, and it wasn't fancy, and it didn't work very well. And then it was tedious to write and maintain new object connections. Every time we wanted to um, connect a new system, we had to write all the boilerplate. We had to interact with the API, create the table models, and uh, and run them, and uh, it seems like we still even had a lot of problems doing that. And deployment. Oh, deployment. The connector app was, we had access to our, our customer servers, which that, that's not a scalable thing. What are you going to tell every customer if, as you scale? If you get 100 customers, actually, we need to be able to log into your server to install our software. I think any IT professional would look, you, look, look at you like you were an idiot. And then, of course, there was cloud service and everything else. There was a backing API. So deployments were weekly and kind of looked like this. <laughs> over and over again. Hmm. I remember spending a lot of time at night. I would do deploy. I would go home to my family. A couple of guys who didn't have any kids would um, do the deployment, and I would log in as soon as my kids went to bed and work with them until midnight. It was pretty bad. And then the transferring via stored procedure. I will come back to that because that's going to be important soon. So this is the second rewrite. This is the, so that was the first thing, sort of setting the stage for the product. We were really uh, proving out the product, making sure that it worked, developing good requirements. And this is where I come in. And they interviewed and hired me as a senior developer. Now, I look back at that moment, and I can tell you that there was no business. I had no business being a senior developer of any kind. I was barely more than a junior. I still get stuff done. But fake it till you make it, right? So I was hired as a senior developer, uh, and I took that title seriously. I wanted to be a senior. I wanted to help people. I wanted to um, make coding easier. So what did I do? I dove right in like this guy. <laughs> 
fairly painful, but I did it. So this is our CEO, Tom. And Tom was like, hey, we were, I was working in the development de uh, department for this particular larger company that uh, at the time was, Rivet was just a department inside of it. And he said, hey, I'd really like you to start working more on Rivet, not just working on customer projects. And that's when I started working on Rivet. At the time, it was called App Harmony. I'm glad they changed the name. So he gave me a huge list of things to fix. He's like, okay, we need to scale. All right. So we need, an, we have an imperfect development model. It takes a lot of time to attach systems. You need to fix that. Maintenance is a chore. You need to help fix that as well. And there's a lot of data problems and always needed a developer to debug. So need to fix that as well. Okay. So again, this is the picture of the system as it was. So this um, you know, just pointing out some of the problems, the on-prem system, having the connector app installed, it needed to be self-updating. We needed to be the customer to be able to do it themselves. So gave me a fairly comprehensive honey-do list, which is convert existing apps to always on Windows services. Okay. Uh, improve the deployment process. All right. Remove the obscure data bugs. That's challenging. And make development easier and developers more productive. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This was a big list for somebody who was just coming in, who was not a senior developer, to come in and go ahead and do these things. But the challenge was ahead of me, and I took it on. I thought to myself, you got this. So you can do it. Oh, I looked like the guy on the left, wanted to look like the guy in the mirror. That was my goal, to get our application to look like that guy, and myself in that mat for that matter. So, invert, converts existing apps to always on Windows services. Just a few things that I did. The lesson that I learned from this was to reuse all the stuff, reuse all of the things. So, in this particular case, the app backend that I had was a Windows service using Top Shelf, uh, which is a really convenient way to create Windows services. It's a NuGet package. It was super awesome, super, made me super productive um, in terms of making Windows services. And so, that was great. I just reused that. And I learned that when all else fails, do what you know, because your goal is delivery, not perfection. So I did what I was supposed to do. I took the connector app and the, uh, the system app, whatever, the cloud service, and I converted them to always on Windows services. So I needed to get connector service specifically out of task scheduler. No more task scheduler. Always on Windows service. And oh, by the way, it, we've got to be able to see what's going on with the connector service. It has to send us a heartbeat. It has to let us know it's okay. And then there was cloud service where we also had to get it out of task scheduler, make it an always on Windows service, create infrastructure to do our own scheduling, not impossible tasks, just a lot for a lot for me, including with everything else. And um, this is kind of what we ended up with. It actually worked pretty well. Um, so we had cloud service that lived inside of the rivet cloud, which is the big circle. I feel like I missed an opportunity to make that a cloud shape, but we'll use our imaginations. And we also had an API layer and the API layer also had a limited front end. It was ASP.NET 4 as well as the API layer for all of our applications interactions. We had the central database still, uh, we had the system caches still, and then we had our cloud base. We know we connected cloud service to cloud based systems and then connector app communicated through an API layer to on-prem systems. And uh, this, worked really, this worked pretty well for a while. Oh, and remember this guy, Andrew? He came and joined me. He came and joined me at my company um, uh, a few months later. He also explored some opportunities there. And he took what he knew and made our application an Angular application. Our front end was now Angular, which was really cool. We were, we were rewriting the portal. It looked really good. It was working pretty good. And he led that. I also took what I learned and used RabbitMQ to sort of decouple. I, I was anticipating that cloud service might scale out eventually and have multiple instances running. So I used RabbitMQ as sort of the messaging system to signal that services should start and then listen for start service messages and execute on them. So that was thing one, number one done, right? I did it in a week. No, I'm just kidding. I did not do it in a week. That'd be pretty impressive. So the next step was to improve deployment process, improve the deployment process. And to that, we turned to AppVayer. And that was pretty, uh, that was a good choice. At the time, that was the best choice that really was out there for .NET. And so every time we pushed up to source control, it would build the software, run the unit tests, deploy the software, um, which sounds pretty basic now. But at, then, at that point, we hadn't been doing that. So that was a pretty big deal for us. But we only got a little bit of the way there. 
we didn't still we still because the the nature of the tests and uh, app fair's limitations at the time we couldn't run our tests automatically inside of app fair we spent a long time trying to make it work and then the technical limitations to, meant that we had to deploy it all at once and stop all running services to do it essentially what we had built is what's called a distributed monolith maybe the worst kind of monolith um, so it really wasn't any better than the deployment process that I came out with from JC. Uh, actually, it was worse because the stakes were higher. And you remember this thing, the thing that where I consisted, convert existing apps to Windows services? This actually hurt our deployment process. This made our deployment process hard. Doing that thing sacrificed, some, sacrificed a lot of flexibility in how we deployed. So it made deployments a lot more painful than they needed to be. And that was... Lesson learned, technical debt isn't bad, but it can sure be frustrating. And we've all felt that. But on the other side of that, software development is a series of trade-offs. There's never a silver bullet. This is the thing that we had to do in order to make this thing, to, to make this thing more mature. To, at least that's what I felt like I had to do at the time. And our goal was always to improve the deployment process, not make it perfect. And I learned that software development should be iterative, which sounds really simple. But when you're trying to grow in from a junior to a senior mindset, your, your, your goal is, a, is a, you, you think sometimes as a junior that your goal is to just get everything done, just finish it. But that is never how it works. And it was just a really important lesson for me to learn. And I learned it making plenty of mistakes at Rivet. So then we had to remove the obscure data bugs and make development easier and development developers more productive. So the main goal was to move data between databases and manage the, uh, the relationships and re manage all the state of that data as we were moving them between databases. And these are kind of what they looked like. So going over them just a little bit, let's say we're Salesforce and we're integrating with QuickBooks. Um, we have, we have models that represent roughly the same things, but they're not exactly the same, right? So we have a, a customer name on a Salesforce, uh, on a Salesforce customer, which pretty well equiv is equivalent to a name on a QuickBooks. In fact, pretty, pretty much is equivalent. But then let's talk about like things like little idiosyncrasies, like create date and open date, uh, create date and open date. Uh, specifically with, I just picked that off, off the top of my head, but specifically with things like invoices, create dates and open dates don't exactly match up in terms of, in terms of what they do for the business. Uh, but, you know, it, it's close enough, so we'd usually put one data, we, the close-fitting data, into the, uh, into the other column. And originally, they used integration services to do that. Uh, and they got rid of that pretty quickly because they hated it. This was before I got there. And of course, everything was on Entity Framework. Uh, they tried using Entity Framework um, to just copying the models, you know, using for each loops. And that was really slow because of the amount of data that we were doing. We're, we were um, hydrating using with that Entity Framework. So they threw that out the window and moved to stored procedures. Stored procedures. Oh, this was so great. So, I mean, it was the lesser of all the evils for all the things that they had at the time. So this is how the statements looked. It was roughly looked like this with more to check for duplicate data. But there's one thing that I really learned pretty early on, myself included. Developers don't seem to be very good with writing SQL, especially if they're in a hurry. Because this looks fine on its own. But do that for hundreds of objects and sometimes thousands of properties, you know, thousands of properties across all these objects. And by the way, don't ever make a mistake. I mean, there's things built into SQL Server that are just so wonderful, like type coercion, uh, that just make chasing down bugs really simple, right? So developers, our developers specifically, were really bad at writing these stored procedures. They were full of bugs. They had duplicate data problems. So what did they do? In marched me the uh, senior engineer to come to the rescue. This is what I looked like. At least that's what I felt at the time. And I went to my boss and I said, I, I think we can do better. I think that we can use this thing. I don't know much about it. The expression API. We can use some expressions to bind these properties together. And so that's what we did. We created something like this. He, he gave me an hour to make a prototype. I did it in about 40 minutes. And by the way, I didn't, had never used the expression API before. I only know, knew about what it was, not how to use it. Well, that was a pretty cool feather in my cap. So this is what we were able to write instead of stored procedures. We were able to write strongly typed mappings between these two objects. And it, could, it supported joins and really supported some pretty complex behavior. And at the end of the day, these models were turned around and used to generate SQL. 
SQL that looked like this. It was clean, readable SQL, and it was stuff that translated to SQL pretty well. So customer name dot trim turned into L trim, R trim in SQL Server. Create date with a uh, with a uh, null coalescing operator to date time now in case create date was null. Uh, turned into an is null statement. Stuff that Entity Framework does, but we custom built a library to do it ourselves. And again, this was really good. This was a really good change at the time. Made developers super productive. And remember that data paranoia that I told you about? This, like, this lesson was drilled into my brain. I was so afraid of bad data that I was... I was dedicated to making sure that these models, whatever they did, prevented duplicate, scanned for and pretended duplicate, pre prevented duplicate or corrupted or bad data um, in the execution of these things. And I didn't have to ask a developer to do it. I just created a tool that they could use that did all of that magic for them. So let's take the good with the bad. What fit? What didn't? First thing, start with the good. We vastly improved the platform we had at the time, and we improved our deployment story. Improved, not made perfect. Um, and then, of course, we still have to think about the problems, which problems were that deployments were still painful, and we made the development model light years better than writing store procedures, but it still wasn't perfect. So, lesson learned. Uh, I mean, in retrospect, premature optimization is the root of all evil. I really strongly believe this, and that includes... Uh, trying to make developers as productive as possible. You could build something for two years and then turn out to build the wrong thing. What we built at the time and what we did at the time really worked for us. Um, but, again, developers, not so good at writing SQL. At least I'm not. Um, and so these little innocent little SQL statements I had, at some point we added a bunch of customers and then we just hit a wall. Suddenly we were getting deadlocks and timeout errors. And it turns out that the SQL that I admitted was actually a pretty awful SQL. <laughs> it wasn't terrible. It wasn't super terrible. But in terms of scale and efficiency, we hit a wall very quickly. So that's, again, what we ended up with, roughly. And then time went by. Changes were made. Ch -ch -ch changes. And the changes sometimes felt a little bit like this, kind of getting beaten over the head. Um, and... Some of the changes were good. At the time, I spun off my, cons I created a consultancy called Averon Software. That was not an easy conversation to have with my CEO. He said, so what are we going to do without you? And I said, well, I'm hoping you'll be my first customer. Imagine how that conversation went. But I became a consultant, and that's fine. That was a good experience. Um, and then another thing that we changed that was really a good change was removing the central database. That central database, so the guy who architected it originally, he had a data warehousing background. So this made a lot of sense to him. But what we ended up with was a lowest common denominator between all these objects. So we ended up, fa ended up phasing that out. And then another weakness, it was all set-based. And set-based is just not enough when we're talking about customization or it doesn't really reflect well the nuances of workflows. Set-based just doesn't do that very well. So the, the good thing, though, because we were set-based, moving large sets of data was pretty simple. And the straightforward development pattern was established, essentially writing stored procedures in C-sharp, kind of, just writing the SQL in C-sharp and emitting good SQL somewhat. And uh, this was a huge boon to productivity and to data problems. What's the best way to solve for data problems, like support them? Avoid them to begin with. And this tool helped us do that. It saved thousands of hours of developer time. But, again, it poorly represented the nuance of business workflows because we couldn't do record by record. We had to do sets. Uh, it wasn't fast enough for customers, and it certainly wasn't customizable enough. And the customizations that we could do had to be done by developers. And real time. Real time became a real thing. Um, because of the way our processes were engineered, it was very much a batch, a set, a series of batch processes, essentially. And it could take up to an hour, a couple hours to run for some customers. And that wasn't fast enough. They wanted their data to move as quickly as possible from the, as soon as they changed it in one system, move it into another. Ay, ay, ay. So we didn't, so good thing about that though, is that we didn't stick with the central model just because we eventually abandoned it because it stopped making sense, which was a really good decision. And we have lots of pretty happy customers. 
but we needed, mount, we needed to be faster. We needed the data to move faster. We needed more customization. We needed better exception handling, uh, not just exception handling like CLR exceptions. We're talking about exceptions with the data. We'd get calls all the time. Why didn't this record show up? Well, you know, you, you didn't set this particular field, and it became a training exercise. But that becomes problematic when you have lots of people doing it at once. So things like that were hard to track down. And developers still had to put together most of the fires. And then, of course, I had to be thinking about myself, reflecting, looking back at this situation. I was kind of here, right? I, I really, if I'm being honest, I was also kind of here uh, between getting stuff done in senior dev. I was having to think about architecture. I had to think about all these things. But I was still developing that maturity. It's always an ongoing iterative process. But we'll just point the arrow there for simplicity. And the lesson that I learned for myself is to scale people before you scale software. My biggest role then and now at Rivet is to be a multiplier. That's my job. My job is to make my team work better. It's not to make me look like the best. It's not to make me look like the smartest. It's to help them do their job so that we can, we can write software. So it could be something like uh, unblocking them with a technical problem first or discussing some architectural piece that they hadn't thought about. Um, and that included building developer tools, including my stored or my SQL generator. We called them SQL generators because they generated SQL. Um, and that was a way that I acted as a multiplier for the team. I took care of all the underlying things that worked, that, that made that thing work. All they took care of was writing these definitions. And then, of course, I established good patterns for development. I was reading and learning all the time, so I was trying to establish consistent patterns inside of our company. I gave a talk on this at this conference a couple of years ago. It's on YouTube. I think I tweeted out a link to it. And, it's, uh, and it was one pattern that I established that I actually gave a workshop on yesterday. For, and uh, one of the best things that I'd heard from this particular talk was giving it in 2017, and somebody came up to me in 2018 at this event and said, I implemented that pattern at my company and it has made a huge difference in productivity and, and uh, quality. That was a huge, that was like one of the best compliments I'd ever been given. And that was my job to do at Rivet as well. I also tried to enforce consistently okay over inconsistently good. I didn't make a change for the better just because. Actually, I did a lot and I learned not to do that. Um, it's better to be, you know, React hooks is a great, is a great pattern for mutating state in React. But... It's better to be consistent with what your team's doing. If your team's not adopting hooks or not ready to adopt hooks, you shouldn't be using it, right? Same thing applies. Consistently okay, in my opinion, is better than inconsistently, like, this is better pattern here, but applying it once. And then embracing imperfect code, especially if it's backed by tests. I tweeted out that I would take bad code um, backed by good tests any day. And my friend tweeted back and he said, there's an interesting philosophical question. If tests are truly good, how bad can the code be? Thanks, Eric. Always making me think. <laughs> um, and this is just, at the time we were trying to scale, we were selling and and, and for the bottom, at, at the bottom of the line for me was that I was embarrassed by the product, but if you're not, then you've launched too late. Because you might have, you've probably, if you've taken that time to perfect it, then you're not getting feedback. You probably built the wrong thing to begin with. So finally, here's the current phase that we're in, the third rewrite, from a software as a service to a platform as a service. So we decided to buckle down and focus. We had a lot of problems with that old development model. We were destined, we were set on making that better. And we did a pretty good job. This is what we had at the time. So we had a custom, so this is roughly what it, looked like then in the, during the first rewrite, including we added on a customer UI so the customers could interact with our, back, uh, with our back end and sort of see into the window. And we wrote that in React, which was a good choice. And we still had, but we still, with this system, with this architecture, we still had lots of problems, right? So we decided that the first thing that we were going to throw out is developing, making it hard to develop uh, attachments to our system. So we went schemaless, right? Uh, and we didn't do that. We went this like eyes open. We didn't do this just because this was a buzzword. And we chose Azure Cosmos DB, which we've had to grow a lot of um, we had to grow a lot of maturity in very quickly because it operates very differently from SQL Server. But developers, the way we built it, developers are way more productive because they don't have to worry about setting the schema ahead of time in code. Uh, they actually set it in JSON schema. Uh, and it's a pretty cool system, suffice it to say, and it makes developers a lot more productive. 
We also decoupled our application and made it message-based. We, we, we took the learnings from the set-based, batch-based thing, and we decided we need to evaluate every record really quickly and make changes to it and make changes to the systems that we're targeting uh, based on how that record has changed. And we really needed to do that record by record. And a decoupled message-based system has really so, so, um, helped us in that way. And so we chose Azure Service Bus because we're Azure folks. So that record-based system that we've done, that we use, essentially works like this. We have a new record that's added to changed, a trigger of some kind. Somebody's listening for that record to change if they are. And if they are, they will trigger another workflow. A really simple system. In, in, in theory, anyways. Uh, and we found that it works um, a lot better. It certainly works for better for things like real time. And so this is roughly what we have right now. So we're roughly kind of developing an all-in-one UI. We've taken a product of customer-based approach to building our front-end product, to really giving them a good window into our system. And of course, we still have all of the legacy stuff. But at this point, we've converted, we've essentially converted at least all new development from a software as a service to a platform as a service, where we're building out developer tooling and tooling to make our developers' lives easier, as well as you know, hosting their data and making their integrations work via workflows. It's well tested. That was the bottom line. I was sick of, I, I went into Rivet not knowing how to write tests very well, writing them really badly, but we decided to buckle down and really write good tests, and that has made all the difference. We have a turnkey deployment model. We optimized for that. Optimizing for your deployment process will save you a ton of time in the long run, the time and energy in the long run. And that has really worked well for us. But retro, retroing, what are the lessons learned? The, one of the big lessons learned for me is that business is still, it's a business, it's a business or a, a product-based company more than it is a technology company. You have to remember the business. You have to remember your roots, right? There, people don't hire us for their integrations because... It be, it, they hire us for our integrations because of our wealth of knowledge, to build integrations because of our wealth of knowledge in the construction industry specifically. Also learned that monoliths can be okay. Monoliths are okay until they're not. In our case, it wasn't a good monolith. It was a distributed monolith, which is the worst kind of monolith. And um, so that really, we, we built on it and built on it. We didn't just go microservices because it was a buzzword. We did it for as long as it made sense. And... Because our old, some of our biggest customers are still running on that legacy platform, new is cool and shiny, but legacy still matters, right? Because we're still getting checks from those companies to run the integrations. So we're in a transition period, trying to get, strategize how we move all those legacy customers onto our new system. But it's iterative. It just doesn't happen overnight. So this uh, rewrite, this third rewrite, has a lot of promising wins. A very easy development model, comparatively speaking. A boost in supportability. It's a lot faster. And workflows are much more customizable. So the rewrites, so far, working pretty well. You know, I, I, it, certainly the early results and the uh, current results in production are very promising. Um, we've looked backwards and have made a lot of progression forward, which has really been awesome. As far as me, I'm still kind of in the rewrite phase. And I had to rewrite myself in a big way. Because at the end of the day, I really had to let go of the fact that I cannot do it all. I was doing everything, and you just can't do it all forever. Because change is inevitable, and you need to be able to grow with your company as it grows. This is a guy named Steve Blank. I tweeted out a link to the article that I'm about to cite. His article basically said that he was the VP of a startup. He was VP of sales. And he helped them scale tremendously. Um, but at some point, the CEO, they hired a new CEO, and the CEO called him into his office, and he said, you've done amazing work thus far, but I'm firing you because the next phase of this startup, you're not the right guy to run the next phase of uh, the customer side. Um, it's a really great article, but I, I've, and, and, I suggest, and I recommend you read it because it's really an interesting perspective on scaling. But I took this to heart to mean that, like, and not only did I have to let go of everything that I used to do all the time, I had to really mature and build myself up because I couldn't just be a really productive engineer anymore. I had to mature to make the, to mature alongside the company. So I was kind I was, I'm still kind of here and I'm still kind of here, you know, it's just not on a, it's not just two dimensional, right? And in some ways I'm still kind of here. I have conversations with my boss all the time where I kind of realize that I'm still thinking like a get stuff done dev in, in my day to day. It is what it is, right? Can't do it all. Can't be perfect all the time. 
So somewhere along these rewrites, I'm trying to get it right. Um, but I will say that uh, if you hear me give this talk again, uh, and, it's seven, and next year it's seven rewrites, one startup and architect's journey, uh, it might very well be uh, my journey to unemployment if I'm not careful. So ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference.